Hey everybody, welcome back. I'm Professor Seth Monahan, and today we're going to start with a quiz. What do Vivaldi, Jerome Kern, and Lionel Richie all have in common? The answer is not fabulous hair. Sorry, Jerome. No, the answer is that all three wrote awesome music using a device that happens to be the topic of our video today. It's called the Falling Fifth Sequence. Now, if you're a regular viewer, you may remember that Lesson 39 laid out all the things you need to know about musical sequences in general. If you haven't watched that one, or if you need a refresher, you may want to go back and start there, because I'm just going to dive right in and assume you've got all the basic terms and concepts that you need. And I want to start today with an eight-bar passage from one of Schubert's late impromptus for piano. And when I play it, I think you'll have no trouble hearing, one, that it is a sequence, and two, that it's built with a two-bar model followed by three copies, each a step lower than the last. So the sequence goes down by step. What about harmony? First, I want to point out that every one of these eight bass notes has its own chord, meaning that there are two chords in the model and two in each copy. That's exactly what we'd expect. Second, all the chords are in root position. We start with one and four seven, and then we move those down by step to seven seven and three seven. And then 6, 7, and 2, 7. And finally, 5, 7, and 1. Now, because this particular bass line is made entirely from chord roots, it helps us see where this type of sequence gets its name. Notice first that the bass lays out a kind of giant zigzag pattern. And within that pattern, every new chord root is either a fourth above or a fifth below the one before. Now, if you've made it this far into the series, you probably know that that's actually the same move, so to speak, right? Going up by fourth takes us to the same note as going down by fifth. So we can save time by just saying that all the chord roots, quote, fall by fifth. That's why we call it a falling fifth sequence. And the chord progression it uses should sound really familiar if you've ever heard classical music or pop music or jazz standards or film scores or children's TV. They all use it, and it sounds like this. So after we listen to Schubert's version one more time, we're going to start making a list of crucial points. Okay, there are two big takeaways so far, things that are pretty much always true. One, in this type of sequence, chord roots always move by falling fifth or rising fourth. Two, while this is happening, the sequence itself descends by step. But listen, I need you to pay extra special attention here, because this is where people get confused. There's always some panicky student who asks me, wait, wait, how does a sequence fall by fifth and go down by step at the same time? The thing this student needs to remember is that the model, like all the copies, contains two chords. So there's a falling fifth motion within each model and copy, and between each model and copy. In other words, the chord roots move twice as fast as the sequence itself. And we can see from Schubert that if your roots fall by fifth twice, you end up a step below where you started. So if these two points are clear, we can start looking at some of the variables involved, because there are a lot with this type of sequence. For now, let's consider four. Chord types, baseline, starting chord, and types of root motion. In this first Schubert example, we saw that the chords were generally diatonic seventh chords. In other words, seventh chords that used the notes in the key. The baseline, as we saw, was the big zigzag that results from all the chords being in root position. The starting chord was the tonic, which it often is. And then there's the type of root motion. Well, what does that mean? Here I'm talking about the type of fifths that the roots fall through. This is really important. You know, generally when we think about fifths being chained together, the image that comes to mind is the so-called circle of fifths. 
But the thing we call the circle of fifths is actually a circle of perfect fifths. No matter where you start, to go all the way around, to get back to that point, you have to go through all 12 enharmonic notes. But if you do that, you can't stay in any one key like Schubert does. So think about it. He starts on E flat, goes counterclockwise around the circle to A flat, then to D flat, then to G flat, then to C flat, and then to not F flat. F flat may sound cool, but it takes us outside of the key. To stay in the key, Schubert doesn't want F flat. He wants the root C flat to go to the root F natural. That lets him finish the sequence in the original key. Now, obviously, what's left here doesn't look much like a circle anymore, but it can. Watch. What we have now is a diatonic circle of fifths, which is to say a circle of fifths that are not all the same size, but whose notes all live in a single key. What you get are six perfect fifths and then one diminished fifth. And where that diminished fifth falls is gonna be different depending on the key you're in. So here it's between C flat and F. And that rogue fifth, which I'm showing with a dotted line, defines this as the space that Schubert's sequence moves through. But if we went into a different key, say F sharp minor, that diminished fifth is going to be in a different spot. Now it'll turn up between D and G sharp, and here's a falling fifth sequence in that key. So under types of root motion, we're going to put diatonic fifths but other types are possible. In video 41, we're gonna look at sequences whose roots don't all live in a single key, but not yet. For now, we're gonna stick with simpler variations of the basic formula, starting with this passage from Mozart's last piano sonata. When I play it, notice the ways it sounds similar to the Schubert, even though it's in major rather than minor. Now, I'm sure you noticed that just like Schubert, Mozart has one model and three copies. And because the sequence also starts and ends on tonic, the Roman numerals should all be the same, by which I mean 1, 4, 7, 3, 6, 2, 5, 1. However, notice two important differences. Here, all the chords are diatonic triads. There are no seventh chords. And half of them are in first inversion. That gives us a different kind of bass line, up by step and then down by third over and over again. And the result is a tighter, narrower zigzag than the one we get with all root position chords, which would have sounded like this. So let's go over here again and jot this down. Diatonic triads are an option, as is mixing root position and first inversion chords. So now let's go back and hear the Mozart sequence in context, where it starts the second part of a 12-bar musical sentence. As it happens, of all the falling fifth sequences we'll see today, this one is the closest to the harmonic sequence that got us rolling in video 39. You might remember it was from one of Haydn's Opus 20 quartets. Well, a lot of this should look familiar now. There's a model and three copies that move down by step. There's a bass line that moves twice as fast as the overall sequence in a kind of shallow zigzag pattern. There's a full run through an entire diatonic circle of fifths.
and the shallow zigzag bass tells us we're mixing root position and first inversion chords. But now the first inversion harmonies are mostly seventh chords instead of triads. So that gives us one more thing to jot down over here. We can mix diatonic triads and seventh chords. Moving on, the next sequence is by J.S. Bach, and it has a bunch of new features. This is the first C-sharp minor prelude from the Well-Tempered Clavier, and it actually starts with a kind of hypnotically slow proto-sentence. There's a two-bar imitative idea that sits on tonic, followed by a repetition on the dominant. Then the sequence starts, but it's slightly shorter than the ones we've seen before. It's a model plus two copies. And the sequence doesn't start on tonic like the ones before. It seems at first to start on 6-4-2 in C-sharp minor, but looking ahead we see that this sequence isn't really in C-sharp minor at all. It modulates, which sequences do all the time and rather easily. We are in fact headed to E, the relative major and we can understand the entire sequence in terms of that key. One reason I like thinking of the sequence in E major is that it has the model starting on 4. I like that because 4 is the other harmony that we usually find at the start of these sequences. And finally, I want you to notice the chord inversions here. They're all inverted 7th chords, and the pattern, 4 twos alternating with 6 fives, produces a slow-moving stepwise bass. Notice that the bass doesn't even move between the model and the copies. It only moves within them and then holds into the next chord. So let's mark this down. The starting chord is often 4 instead of 1, and the bass can sometimes be a slow stepwise descent when we alternate 1st and 3rd inversion 7th chords. Let's listen to the whole thing. So if you happen to like your keyboard pieces with you know, more notes than this one, you'll be pleased to see that our next example is the C minor prelude from the same book. We saw the first four bars of this one back in video 29 when we were talking about functional cycles over tonic pedals. The sequence comes just after. It's got a two-bar model and two and a half copies. And it's another one of these modulating sequences that starts on four of the new key. But we're going to add in chromatic chords this time, and here's how. The first chord in each model and copy is a first inversion diatonic triad. So 4-6, 3-6, 2-6, and 1-6. But each of these is set up by its own dominant 4-2 chord. And only the last one of these is in the key. The others are all applied dominants. So suddenly we've got a very colorful and dynamic progression. But not a very interesting bass line. As we just saw, mixing first inversion chords with 4-2 sonorities gives us a slow, stepwise bass line. Mm -hmm. 
here's how the whole thing sounds. And now let's make sure that we add applied dominance to our little inventory. Next up is a third keyboard piece by the Elder Bach. This time it's the two-part invention in A minor. And it starts by tossing the main motive between the hands with implied tonic and dominant harmonies. And then comes the sequence. Now, right out of the gate, it's clear that this is a shorter sequence than the others we've seen. Just a model and one copy. That is not uncommon. Though when it happens, the sequence is very often built to end on the tonic, like it does here. As far as chords go, it seems at first like the sequence is arpeggiating 1-7 and 4-7 in A minor, but if we look ahead, it's clear that we're moving into the relative major, meaning that we might prefer to understand the sequence in that key. The other big difference between this falling fifth sequence and all the other ones we've seen is that it doesn't really have a bass line, per se. By which I mean the bottom voice is just one of two equal partners in the counterpoint. It continually trades ideas with the right hand and generally stays pretty busy. So while it's easy to say what, quote, the chords are, it's A minor, D minor, G, and C, we can't really describe them as being in this or that inversion. So let's make sure to put that in our running list. If the bass line is sufficiently melodic, if it's a true contrapuntal voice, then we don't really have chord inversions or the bass line patterns we associate with them. Now, this invention does one other really common thing that we haven't seen yet. The sequence we just studied leads directly into another sequence, which in turn leads to a cadence in C major. This second shorter sequence is instructive, because we might assume at first that it just uses the same chord progression as the one before. Notice the downbeats going down by fifth. So is it 6, 2, 5, 1 again? Well, no. It turns out there are some notes in the left hand that don't fit in those chords, and that don't act like non-chord tones. What we have here is actually a sequence that can't be explained in terms of a clear chord progression. And this isn't rare. We see these all the time in Bach's music. They descend by step, and they kind of even feel like falling fifth sequences, but they're just not. And they help to remind us that Baroque composers didn't think about sequences in terms of chord progressions like we do. Sometimes our modern tools just don't quite fit the task. So let's listen to a real pianist play this example, and then close up shop with a bit more about chains of sequences like this one. So my last two examples also feature chains of sequences like this, but there are a few differences. First, they chain together sequences that are not ambiguous. They're all clearly of the falling fifth variety. And second, the falling fifth root motions lead directly from one sequence into the next. I'll show you what I mean. Here is a passage from Mozart's G major piano concerto. The passage itself happens to be in D minor, don't ask. But the chords are exactly what we saw in our very first example, a complete pass through the diatonic circle of fifths in D minor, with all diatonic seventh chords. But that one chord progression actually spans two sequences. The first one has a two-bar model and copy, and the second one has a one-bar model and copy. This is very common. In chains of sequences, the units typically get shorter as you go to build a sense of momentum and forward direction. And for all of you who watched video 36, here's a quick shout out for the Neapolitan sixth chord that Mozart uses just before the cadence. So 
So our last example is another keyboard concerto, this one by J.S. Bach, and it also happens to be in D minor, and it's complicated enough that I want to sketch it out for you first. It chains three sequences together using one incredibly long pass around a single diatonic circle of fifths. D, G, C, F, B flat, E flat, A, D, G, C, F, B flat, E flat, A, D, G, C, and F. Each of the sequences has a model and two copies, but as we'll see, each moves twice as fast as the previous one. The first of these is the most complicated sequence we'll see today, because it does something that's actually not super common. The bones of the sequence themselves are not especially remarkable. It's just a mix of root position and first inversion triads. The only interesting wrinkle is that Bach actually uses the Neapolitan there near the end. So far, so good, but now for the weird part. Bach actually prepares each of these chords with its own applied dominant seventh, like this. The result being that instead of two chords, the model and copy each contain four chords. Let's build this in stages using actual notation. Here's a bass line. And here's the basic underlying chord progression. And notice that I'm leaving out the second half of each bar. Above each of these bass notes, there's a catchy little stepwise motive, and if I play only what's on screen, it's a perfectly functional falling fifth sequence. But in the actual concerto, that motive has a little tail, and that's when the applied sevens turn up. What's left is mainly just filler in the strings. But while all this is going on, the keyboardist is just tearing through arpeggiations of each chord. Here's a great recording of Andra Schiff with some wonderful improvised little flourishes. Okay, so that's the first sequence. The second one, which moves faster, takes us from D minor into B flat major, and it's based on a series of first inversion triads. These come second in the model and copies. There's three six, which is the old one six, and then two six, and finally one six. And each of these is preceded by an applied dominant. We'll hear that one in a second, along with sequence number three, which moves in half bars and is all diatonic in B-flat, with the slow stepwise bass we heard earlier. So to hear this sequence chain in its entirety, we're going to do something a little different today. Instead of listening to a commercial recording, we're going to watch a video of a live performance by one of my subscribers. Last year, it was my distinct treat to meet fellow YouTuber Leo online. Leo is currently 12 years old, and he is a ridiculously talented pianist, drummer, and composer. I am proud to call him my friend and amazed, frankly, that he watched every video in this series. But it was when I was watching one of his videos that I first heard this big compound sequence. So here is Leo playing Bach's D minor concerto with the La Mirada Symphony, and with my analysis laid in underneath.
Keep an eye on this kid, folks. He is just getting started. As opposed to me, a washed-up old geezer who just hopes to live long enough to finish video 41, which takes a look at some more advanced chromatic falling fifth sequences. Don't miss it. Cause I wonder where you are And I wonder what you do Are you somewhere feeling lonely Or is someone loving you Tell me how to win your heart For I haven't got a clue But let me start by saying